Welcome in, everyone. So today we're taking a deep dive into the heart of Ghana's 2024 election. And we're doing it through the lens of the NDC's manifesto. Yeah, think of it as their kind of a master plan, right? Like their big vision for what they're calling Ghana 2.0. Exactly. But now, before we get too far into it, we're not here to tell you, you know, who to vote for or anything like that. Right. We just want to unpack some of the key issues and the NDC's proposed solutions. Sure. And leave you with, hopefully, some interesting questions to ponder. Yeah, and what I find really fascinating about this manifesto is the, uh, the stark contrast that it paints. Oh, yeah. Almost like, imagine, like, a balance scale, right? Okay. On one side, you've got the NDC's kind of, you know, portrayal of their previous administration, a time of, you know, progress, prosperity. Good times. Yeah, the good old days, right? And then on the other side, you have the current state of Ghana, which they describe as a period of hardship and decline. Yeah, it's a it's a powerful way to frame their argument for change. Very much. For yeah. sure. And they really don't shy away from painting a very... Um, vivid picture of the struggles that everyday Ghanaians are facing. Right. I mean, the manifesto is, it's filled with what they call these harrowing stories of yeah. economic hardship. Um, they even introduce us to some new vocabulary like haircuts and domestic debt exchange. Sure. These are terms that uh, I think really highlight just the severity of the economic crisis that, that they're talking about. It's like they're saying, you know, look, this isn't just about numbers on a spreadsheet. Yeah. This is about real people. Right. Your neighbors, maybe even you, facing yeah. real difficulties. Yeah. And they drive that point home with, you know, some powerful imagery in the manifesto. Yeah. You know, like pensioners, people who have worked their entire lives for Ghana, reduced to picketing just to try to access their own savings. Oh, well, yeah. It's, it's really... It's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking image. It really is. And it's one that I think is designed to resonate. You know, Absolutely. Because it speaks to this very real sense of economic insecurity that I think a lot of Ghanaians are feeling right now. Yeah. And that really underpins their central argument, right? It does. That Ghana is experiencing what they call national decay. Mm -hmm. They use that term repeatedly throughout the manifesto. Yeah. And what they're saying is this isn't just a few isolated problems here and there. It's, it's like a systemic issue that's affecting the entire nation. It's in the very fabric, they argue. Right. And they really emphasize the unprecedented nature of this decay. Yeah, right? yeah. Like we've never seen it this bad, they're saying. Yeah. And they point to some... Uh, let's just say alarming economic indicators. Okay. I mean, imagine a debt to GDP ratio soaring past 100%. Whoa. Inflation uh -huh. above 50%. Wow. Unemployment skyrocketing. It's a scary picture. These aren't just abstract figures on a page, right? You know. These represent a nation that is grappling with a very, very real economic crisis. So, having painted this, you know, pretty bleak picture of national decay. Yeah. The NDC then lays out its plan. Like, here's here's the roadmap to recovery. Here's the plan. This is it. Hit the reset button, as they call it. Their vision to build the Ghana we want together. Right. It's a call for kind of collective action and a return to what they see as a brighter past. It's a compelling narrative. Right? It is. It's this classic before and after strategy. Yeah. The Ghana we left for the MPP. That's a quote. Okay. Versus Ghana now the MPP's mess, another quote. Okay, so they're really drawing a line in the sand there. They're drawing a very sharp distinction. Okay. And to kind of drive home this contrast, they spend a lot of time showcasing what they call the Ghana we left behind. Mm -hmm. You know, they tout their achievements. The University of Ghana Medical Center. Right. The state-of-the-art facility. Mm. The Tima Port expansion. Mm -hmm. Positioning Ghana as a trade hub. The Comenda Sugar Factory. Okay a project that was meant to boost local industry. So these are all tangible examples of the progress they claim to have made during their previous administration. Exactly, they're saying, look, we built this, we did this, right. we have a track record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they juxtapose these achievements with what they call the unbearable cost of living crisis mm -hmm. that's gripping Ghana today. Which is something that I think a lot of Ghanaians are feeling very acutely right now. They are. Yeah. And they use statistics like, you know, 8.5 million Ghanaians experiencing hunger. Wow. To illustrate the severity of the situation. Yeah, yeah. It's about resonating with voters' daily realities. Absolutely. They're basically saying, you know, remember when we built this? Yeah. Remember when things were better? Exactly. But, okay, enough looking back, right? Let's get to the heart of the matter. 
their proposed solutions. They have this very catchy title for it. They call it Resetting the Economy and Creating Prosperity for All. Catchy, right. Which sounds great on paper. It does. But what does it actually entail? Well, this is where the manifesto shifts from kind of, you know, critique to blueprint, right? right. Okay. Like, here's what we're actually going to do. Here's the plan. And they propose starting with immediate relief. Okay. Like what? Like scrapping what they call draconian taxes. Give me some examples. What kind of taxes are we talking about? They talk about the e-levy. Okay. The COVID levy. Right. Taxes that have been a major point of contention in Ghana. Very unpopular. Very unpopular. So it's a clear attempt to provide some immediate relief to struggling Ghanaians. It's like a breath of fresh air. Right? A little bit of breathing room. Right. For taxpayers, yeah. for sure. But beyond those kind of immediate measures, what's their what's their broader economic philosophy? So they really emphasize this idea of prioritizing the microeconomy. Okay. So instead of focusing solely on those big picture indicators, mm -hmm. you know, they're talking about really investing in sectors that directly impact people's lives. Okay, so like what? Like what kind of sectors are we talking about? Yeah, agriculture, manufacturing. Right. And this was really intriguing, the 24-hour economy. The 24-hour economy. Okay, I like that. So paint a picture for me. What does that look like? Imagine a Ghana that is buzzing with activity around the clock. Okay. It's a system designed to boost productivity, generate jobs. Okay. By encouraging businesses, even public services in some cases, to operate in three eight-hour shifts. Wow. They argue this will transform Ghana into a more dynamic and competitive economy. So they're talking about a fundamental shift in how Ghana functions, almost like turning it into a 247 society. Precisely. That's ambitious. Very much so. But what exactly does this 24-hour economy look like in practice? Like, how do they see it actually working? Well, they're very laser focused on making Ghana a manufacturing powerhouse. Okay. Boosting agro-processing, creating what they call an import substitution and export-led economy. Okay, break that down for me. What does that mean? So imagine locally produced goods flooding the market okay reducing reliance on imports okay and even competing on a global stage so it's a vision of a self-reliant ghana exactly a nation that produces what it consumes and makes its mark on the world stage yeah they argue that this approach will not only create jobs but also enhance ghana's economic sovereignty i see and to support this very ambitious vision what kind of specific policies are they proposing well they propose a range one example is the establishment of a women's development bank. Okay. Aimed at providing women-led businesses with access to capital. So it's about empowering women to become drivers of economic growth, essentially. Exactly. And they also highlight their national apprenticeship program, which aims to equip young Ghanaians with in-demand skills. Right. Making them more competitive in the job market. Exactly. It's about preparing the next generation. Right. For the demands of this 24-hour economy. Yeah. But it's not just about these kind of broad economic policies. Okay. They also delve into specifics for some key sectors. Like education, healthcare, agriculture. Right. Aiming to resonate with, I think, a wider audience. And those are areas that really touch the lives of every single Ghanaian, right? Absolutely. Every single one. So let's let's delve into those sector-specific plans a little bit. Okay. Starting with education. Okay. They're proposing something they're calling a no-academic-fee policy for first-year tertiary students. Ambitious. Which essentially means making the first year of university free. It's a bold promise. It is. And they argue, of course, that this will make higher education more accessible, especially for those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Right. Breaking down those barriers. Exactly. But they're not stopping there. No. They're also planning to tackle the furniture shortage in schools with a Furniture for All initiative. Right, because a lot of schools are lacking basic furniture. Absolutely. And remember all the controversies surrounding the double track system. Of course. Yeah. They're promising to abolish that as well. A big promise. It is. So it's about addressing some of the most kind of, you know, pressing challenges facing Ghana's education system. Absolutely. And it's about sending a clear message, I think. Okay. That they're prioritizing education. And they're not forgetting about the teachers. Very important. Which is huge, right? Because I think... Often, teachers are overlooked. Absolutely. They're launching something they're calling a Teacher Dabre 3 project to improve teachers' living conditions. It's recognition. Recognizing their vital role in shaping Ghana's future. So it's a very comprehensive approach, I think, 
aiming to improve the education experience for both students and educators. From the ground up, really. But what about healthcare? Okay. Another crucial sector. Absolutely crucial. What are their plans there? Well, their big thing when it comes to healthcare is um, free primary healthcare. Okay. They're talking about establishing a Ghana Medical Care Trust Fund. Okay. Which they've cleverly branded Mahama Cares. Mahama Cares. I see what they did there. It's a good one. Okay. And this fund is designed to provide financial support for Ghanaians who are battling chronic illnesses. Okay. Things like kidney failure, cancer, sickle cell disease. Right. So these are very serious, often very expensive to treat conditions. Exactly. Financially draining. Mm -hmm. So it's a targeted approach, okay. focusing on some of the most financially draining health challenges that Ghanaians face. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. But are they only focused on treatment or are there plans to kind of improve the healthcare system as a whole? Both. Okay. They are pledging to upgrade hospitals. Okay, which one? They talk specifically about turning Corleboo Teaching Hospital right. into a world-class facility. No, that's a big one. Uh, that would be a game changer. The goal is to reduce, you know, medical tourism. Yeah. Ghanaians having to travel abroad to seek it's, treatment. It's right? a huge drain on resources. Yeah, right. It's actually, keep those healthcare dollars within the country. Now let's move on to another sector that I think is very close to the hearts and stomachs of many Ghanaians. Okay. Agriculture. Very important. What is the NDC's plan to revitalize this very crucial sector? Well, their Feed Ghana program takes center stage. Feed Ghana program, okay. This is about tackling food insecurity head on. Okay. Modernizing agricultural practices, boosting local food production. So less reliance on imported rice, for example. Exactly. More meals made with Ghanaian grown grains. Exactly. It's about putting more food on Ghanaians' tables. Right. While reducing their dependence on foreign imports. And are they just talking about kind of increasing yields generally, or are there more specific initiatives that they're highlighting? They get into specifics. Okay, like what? They're introducing a vegetable development project okay. to increase the production of staple crops, tomatoes, onions, things like that. Okay. They're also tackling the struggling poultry industry Right. with a poultry farm to table initiative. Poultry farm to table, catchy. Yeah. Aiming to make Ghana more self-sufficient in poultry production. Okay. And then there's their plan for the palm oil industry. Ah, uh, yes, palm oil, of course. The elephant in the room. Yeah, exactly. It's been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons lately. <laughs> so how does the NDC plan to address the challenges, but also capitalize on the potential of this, let's be honest, very controversial crop? Well, they draw a bold comparison okay. with Cote d'Ivoire. Right, a regional leader in palm oil production. Exactly. Okay. And they argue that Ghana not only has the potential to meet its local demand for palm oil, okay, but also to become a major exporter. Wow, okay. So they propose developing large-scale palm plantations while also supporting small-scale farmers okay. to participate in the industry. So it's about creating kind of a thriving palm oil sector that benefits both large and small scale producers. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And they also talk about establishing processing plants, you know, to add value locally. Right. Instead of just exporting raw materials. Right. But they do acknowledge the environmental concerns surrounding palm oil production, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And to their credit, they dedicate a significant portion of the manifesto to what they call responsible mining and sustainable agricultural practices. Okay. Emphasizing the need to protect Ghana's forests and water bodies from the negative impacts that those industries can have. Right, because it's about finding that balance. Right, right. it is a balancing act. Between economic development and environmental protection. It's a tough one. Which can be tricky. It's not always easy. But beyond those specific sectors, they also address a more systemic issue that's been plaguing Ghana for years, and that is corruption. The C word. Right. And they don't mince words. No. They call it a cancer that is eroding public trust and hindering progress. And rightfully so. Strong words. So how do they propose to tackle this cancer and restore faith in Ghana's governance? They're promising a two-pronged approach. Cleaning wow. house and reclaiming what's been lost. Okay, I like it. So what does that look like in practice? Well, they pledge to significantly reduce the size of government. Okay. They're talking about appointing no more than 60 ministers 
which is a stark contrast to the current administration. So it's almost like they're saying, we're going to slim down the government. Become more efficient. Make it more efficient. Okay. But it's not just about reducing the size, right? Well, it's also I'm... about accountability. It's accountability, exactly. And they're launching something they call Operation Recover All Loot. <laughs> it's catchy. Which sounds, I mean, that sounds pretty intense. It's very dramatic. It definitely grabs your attention. So break it down for me. What is Operation Recover All Loot? So Operation Recover All Loot is all about investigating and prosecuting cases of alleged corruption. Okay. With the goal of, you guessed it, recovering misappropriated funds. Okay. They're basically saying, if you've benefited illegally, yeah, we're coming for you. It's a very strong message. So it's about restoring faith in the system, showing that no one is above the law. Exactly. But it's not just about going after the bad guys, so to speak, right? It's also about preventing corruption from happening in the first place. Exactly. And they talk about strengthening institutions, promoting transparency, okay, empowering independent bodies to hold those in power accountable. Okay. It's about building a system where corruption is less likely to take root in the first place. So it's like they're saying, we're not just going to come in and clean up the mess. Yeah. We're going to try to fix the leaky pipes so that the mess doesn't happen again. Exactly. Exactly. A more sustainable approach. And speaking of fixing things, they also lay out their plans for social inclusion with a very strong emphasis on women's empowerment. Absolutely. This is a big part of their platform. Okay, like what kind of specific things are they proposing? Well, for one, they're committing to a minimum 30% quota for women in all political appointments, which is a significant step. It is. That's huge. Toward gender parity and leadership. Yeah. But they're not stopping there. Okay. They're also talking about establishing a women's development bank. Okay. To provide women-led businesses with access to low-interest loans okay. and tailored financial services. So it's not just about giving women a seat at the table. Right. It's about giving them the tools to kind of build their own table. Exactly. They want to empower women to become economic powerhouses in their own right. I like it. But it's not just about women, right? Right. They also address the needs of other vulnerable groups. They do. For example, they plan to reintroduce the Eben Elderly Welfare System. Eben Elderly Welfare System. What is that? So this system provides free access to social and health services, public transportation for the elderly. Okay, so it's about making sure that senior citizens have a safety net that they're cared for. Absolutely. It's about dignity and respect for the elderly. And they haven't forgotten about persons with disabilities either. Absolutely not. They're pledging to improve the lives of persons with disabilities by, for example, mandating a 5% hiring quota in the public sector. Okay. And providing targeted support for women with disabilities, recognizing the unique challenges they face. So it's about creating a more inclusive society overall. Exactly. Where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. I like that. Okay. Now let's talk about their big push initiative. The big push, okay? This is a big one. This is where they outline their commitment to infrastructure development. Massive investment. We're talking about $10 billion. A billion dollars. That's a lot of CDs. A lot of CDs. And this is across crucial sectors. We're talking water, transportation, and of course, energy. So new roads, improved water systems, expanded access to electricity. I mean, this is pretty ambitious. Very ambitious. It's about modernizing Ghana's infrastructure and laying the foundation for future growth, they argue. Okay, but <clears throat> $10 billion. How do they plan to fund this big push? Well, they're banking on a combination of things. Okay. Increased government revenue, foreign investment. They also talk about partnerships with international development institutions. Okay. They're basically arguing that by creating a more attractive investment climate, by tackling corruption, right. they can attract the resources they need to fund these ambitious projects. So it's a gamble. It is. But one that they clearly believe will pay off in the long run. In the long run, exactly. But let's not forget about, I think, one of the most crucial aspects of their big push initiative, and that's energy. Of course, because you can't have a thriving 24-hour economy without a reliable power supply. Exactly. So what's their plan for kind of, I don't know, keeping the lights on in Ghana? Well, they propose a multi-pronged approach, as you might expect. Okay. Firstly, they want to tackle the financial woes of the energy sector, which they blame squarely on the current administration's mismanagement. Okay. They're talking about restructuring debt, improving efficiency. Okay. Basically getting the house in order. 
and they argue that by doing so, they can stabilize the sector and make it more attractive to investors. Okay, so it's like they're saying, before we can even think about building new power plants, we have to fix what's broken. Exactly. you got to get the fundamentals right. Yeah. But it's not just about fixing existing problems. They also have plans for the future. Okay, like what? So they want to boost oil and gas production in the short term. Okay. But at the same time, they're talking about investing heavily in renewable energy sources. Okay, like what? Give me some specifics. Solar, wind. They even talk about exploring the potential of nuclear power. Nuclear power. Now that's interesting. It's a bold move. It is. But it sounds like they're aiming for a more diversified energy mix. Right, which makes sense given the global shift towards renewables. Absolutely. They're trying to balance the immediate need for reliable and affordable electricity with the long-term goal of a more sustainable energy future for Ghana. Okay, so it's about keeping the lights on today while building a brighter tomorrow. Well said. But speaking of a brighter tomorrow, let's shift gears a little bit to an area that I know is close to the hearts of many Ghanaians. Okay. And that is sports. Ah, yes. The beautiful game. Exactly. And it's fair to say that things haven't been so rosy lately, right? Well, I mean, Ghana has a rich sporting history. We have. We have. But it's no secret that, you know, the Black Stars haven't shown as brightly as they once did. Yeah. And other sports have also struggled. Right. So what's the NDC's plan to kind of get Ghana back on the winning track, so to speak? Well, their plan centers around systematic, long-term investment in sports development. Okay, what does that look like in practice? So for starters, they're promising to upgrade existing sports infrastructure. Okay. We're talking about those aging national stadia. Right. They need a facelift. They do, they do. And they're also talking about building new multi-purpose sports facilities across the country. Okay, so it's about more than just, you know, bricks and mortar though, right? Right. What about nurturing the next generation of athletes? That's key, and they recognize that. They're emphasizing talent development from the ground up. Okay. We're talking scholarships for promising young athletes, specialized sports academies. Uh -huh. They even talk about upgrading the University of Education, huh. Winneboss Sports College, into a full-fledged sports university. A sports university? Wow. That's thinking big. They're thinking long-term. Yeah. They want to create a clear pathway for talented athletes to hone their skills and reach their full potential. And it's not just about producing, you know, Olympic medalists or world champions, right? Right. It's about making sports more accessible to all Ghanaians, regardless of their background or their ability. So things like, you know, community sports programs, initiatives to promote fitness and make physical education a core part of the curriculum. It's about recognizing the broader social and developmental benefits of sports. Creating a healthier, more active, more united Ghana through the power of sports. Well said. I like it. It sounds like a winning goal to me. Absolutely. But there's one more area I want to touch on before we wrap up. Okay. And it's an area that really underpins everything we've discussed so far, and that is governance. Governance, the bedrock of yeah. any successful nation. Exactly. And this is where the NDC really draws a very clear distinction between their vision and what they see as the current state of affairs. Okay. They argue that Ghana, under the current administration, is plagued by corruption, a lack of accountability, a disregard for democratic principles. I mean, they're really painting a pretty bleak picture. Yeah. They're not mincing words. They're saying, this is not the Ghana we want. So given that, how do they propose to fix it? What's their plan? Well, their plan centers around what they call restoring good governance and fighting corruption. Okay. Remember, Operation Recover All Loot. Yeah. That's a key part of their strategy. Right. Going after those ill-gotten gains. Exactly. Making sure that those who have engaged in corrupt practices are held accountable. But it's not just about punishment. Right. It's also about prevention. Okay. And so they talk about strengthening institutions, promoting transparency, empowering independent bodies to hold those in power accountable. They're also promising to reduce the size of government, which they argue has become bloated and inefficient. Okay. And they're taking aim at those very controversial ex gratia payments made to political office holders when they leave office. Okay. The NDC is vowing to scrap them entirely. So it's a pretty bold move, I would say. It is. It, yeah. It's definitely going to be controversial. Yeah, and it really seems like they're, you know, trying to position themselves as the party of reform, like renewal. Exactly. A clean break from the past. Cleaning house, as they put it. Exactly. But the question is, can they actually deliver? Right. Because it's one thing to write a manifesto mm -hmm. filled with, you know, these big ambitious promises, but it's 
quite another to actually implement them. Absolutely. In a way that really brings about, you know, real change that people can actually feel. And that's where you, our listeners, come in. Exactly. It's easy to get caught up in the excitement, right? Oh, yeah. Of a campaign season. Mm -hmm. The rallies, the slogans, the promises. It's a lot. It is. It's a lot of noise. It is. But... As engaged citizens, I think it's our responsibility to look beyond the safest. Yeah. To really scrutinize those details, you know. Ask those tough questions. Exactly. Don't just take their word for it or ours for that matter. Right. Read the manifesto for yourself. Exactly. Think critically about what they're proposing. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. Is it feasible? What could the impact be, both positive and negative? Exactly. And most importantly... Does this resonate with me? Right. Does this align with my vision for Ghana's future? Because at the end of the day, this is about your future. Exactly. And I think we've, you know, we've done our best here to walk you through kind of the key points. Mm. We've highlighted some of their ambitious goals. Some of the potential challenges. Exactly. But now it's up to you to decide what you make of it all. Exactly. So do you believe that the NDC can deliver on this promise of a reset? Mm -hmm. Do their proposed solutions actually address the issues that matter most to you? Big questions. These are questions that, you know, we can't answer for you. Only you can answer them. Only you can. Ghana is at a crossroads. It is. And the choices that are made in this election mm -hmm. will shape the nation's trajectory for years, if not decades, to come. Absolutely. So engage in those thoughtful conversations. Yes. Weigh the options carefully. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, make your voice heard. Your voice, your vote, your future. The future of Ghana is in your hands.